Photography, a beginner's guide to picture composition for work and play. So today I'm going to talk about a hobby of mine that I also use for work and some tips that I have picked up along the way that are useful. I'm still learning and there's plenty of scope to improve, but it's fun to practice. These tips are only suggestions, there's no hard and fast rules, and you should practice taking pictures and deciding what works best for you, especially if it is something important. So when looking at this video, I suggest that you pause it and practice the different skills yourself. Find out what you like and get the best results that pleases you. For me, Photography is an essential component in my work in showing others what I see. For instance, here are the development stages of a lobster. And there's a juvenile lobster on a person's finger in the foreground to give a sense of scale. Another example is this picture on the right of cooked mussels. And there is a story to tell about the biology of these shellfish behind the photo. OK, the first thing to realise, and that we all know this, there are many pictures out there in the world and the number is building fast. So if you want to create an exciting image, you should practice, which is easy, but also learn to think about the process behind taking a picture. Also, delete any of your unwanted pictures shortly after you have taken them, only choosing the best to keep. It is essential to be selective or you'll never have time to go through all your old images. Three, following in line with the last point, only show your best pictures, one or two, as people are absolutely bombarded with pictures. Be considerate and courteous of others when taking a photo. You do not have an automatic right to take a picture of someone. Also, taking an unflattering picture is something to be avoided. We're all photographers now. So what makes your pictures different or unique? What is the purpose of the picture you wish to show? Consider the light. Is it natural? That's coming from the sun. The time of day. Is there shade? If it's artificial light, such as fluorescent light, or do you need a flash? Pictures of people require permission, ask them. And focus on your subject and especially be aware of the background. OK, so what's the best camera? Well, that will depend on what you're looking to photograph. Dedicated cameras typically are focused on obtaining a good image by having large lenses, large sensors and paraphernalia, paraphernalia that is to make the best of the light information available. I'd argue when you take a camera with you, it puts you into the frame of mind into taking a picture. Whereas if you're using your phone camera, it's often more spur of the moment. Having said all of that, phone camera technology and their convenience are very hard to beat. So as an example of using your phone, I'm going to talk about the use of an iPhone. I actually have a Android phone. So the first thing with your phone is to make sure that your lens is clean. Use a lens tissue if it needs to be cleaned. Set the focus on the subject that you want to focus on by placing your finger on the screen and holding it there for several seconds until the focus lock appears. You can adjust the brightness or darkness of your picture by placing your finger on the adjustment slider, which appears just beside the focus square. Uh, move your finger up to make it brighter, move your finger down to make it darker. Typically, it's better to take a picture that's slightly dark if you want to edit it later on, rather than having it slightly overexposed in areas. Activate the burst mode for taking a number of pictures at one time by holding your picture on the picture taking button. Make sure when it's low light conditions, to hold your camera steady to make your image as sharp as possible. So you can rest it on something like a bean bag or a tripod and act, use the three second timer if it's low light conditions. 
And obviously, if it's a group shot, you can use the um, 10 second delay to make sure that you get yourself into the picture. Make sure that the picture is what you want shortly after you've taken it. You can decide whether you want the flash on or off. Often low light, you'll get more ambience if you have the flash off. But as I mentioned earlier, it's important that you can hold the camera or the phone steady to make sure your image is sharp. And it's best to only use filters after you've taken the picture you want, rather than using the app within the phone before you've taken the picture. Another thing taking a picture is decide whether an image should be taken in the landscape format, which is this shown on sidewards, or you should take it in the portrait mode, which is the typical way if you're holding your phone uh, facing away from you, or it's often offered to take a square mode, but I would suggest that you stick to landscape or portrait as you can often crop the picture at a later stage. An important consideration before you start taking your pictures is how you might want to show them. It's important because you really need to decide at the outset of how high the quality of your image is. If you're going to show them on a computer screen, a phone, a online, Facebook, Snapchat, etc., the low resolution or medium resolution are usually fine. But for the pictures that you might want to print, you'll typically require a higher resolution. So you should be aiming at a, around 300 DPI. So you should, if you think you're going to print a picture, is have it at the highest quality settings that you have available to you. This section deals with the way that you take and present a picture that alters the perception of the viewer to the image. When taking a portrait picture, avoid harsh light. Focus on the eyes, concentrating around the eyes and keep the forehead within the frame. Note that the light in the eyes um, gives a bit more life to the picture. Taking a picture from the side of a person and asking them to turn their head towards the camera can produce a very appealing effect. However, when you're doing this, beware of having too much of their torso or their upper body in the picture, as this can create an unflattering, broadening effect. Before you go to take pictures, know what you're looking to achieve. By knowing what you're looking for, you can then complement your subject to achieve the most flattering angles for them. But you should also respect their view on the pictures you might have taken, if it is not to their liking, as we're all used to seeing ourselves in mirrors rather than seeing ourselves as others might see us. So when taking someone's picture, the way we actually take it can distort their face. It's typically best to step back and zoom in rather than stick your camera straight up to their face. Here are some exaggerated examples, all obviously of the same subject, of how the lens slightly changes our proportions. The first picture on the left is a fairly standard picture obtained by standing back and zooming into the subject at eye level. The image on the right is taken from below the subject. The bottom left is taken by holding the camera close to the nose of the subject, and the bottom right was taken close to the subject's face, but looking down. These pictures are obviously all exaggerated, but they do illustrate the power of where we hold the camera. Do you ever see pictures of people and bits of them are actually missing? One of the rules, well, well not one of the rules, one of the guides to photography is to avoid cutting off people at the joints. So this section deals with taking a picture of their face, their head and shoulders, half body, three quarter body or full body.
This photograph or image shows the ideal locations at which you can crop a person. A picture of someone's face. Think about taking a full or partial headshot. You decide. Um, it's good to get them to have something slightly dynamic to twist their head towards the camera. And if you ask them to lean their head slightly forward from their neck towards the camera, you can get a more flattering image because you can often avoid um, a double chin. You can obviously decide to take a picture to include the upper torso. I want to include most of the upper body. And you can quite safely crop a picture just above the knees. Or down just to the middle of the shins. And you can obviously include all of the body without cutting off any bits. You may have heard about the rule of thirds and it's a helpful way for composing your pictures. Many cameras and some phones provide this grid with four lines. Each takes a third of the frame and divides the picture into nine equal parts. Where the lines cross are known as focal points and they're a good location to place your subject. Try this now by taking pictures with your subject in the middle and then placing them at the focal points the four different locations. You judge what works best, which may well vary with the subject that you take. I've included this picture as part of an example of the rule of thirds. Here's two Connemara ponies that I've placed at the focal points. Here is a guide to dividing your picture into threes. Um, the sky often looks best if it occupies one third or two thirds of your frame. The same follows for watery subjects. You can imagine this picture, uh, this landscape picture is divided roughly into thirds, the sky occupying roughly two thirds of the frame. The temptation as well is to often place the subject in a picture like this in the center of the frame. Try offsetting your subjects to one of the focal points and see if you obtain a pleasing result. By doing this, you also provide a good view of the scenery and its scale to the viewer. Balancing the elements in a picture. Placing your main subject off center, as with the rule of thirds that I've just spoken to you about, can create an interesting picture, but it can leave a void or a space in the scene which can make it feel out of balance or empty. You can achieve a balanced picture with other less important subjects by filling the space. This is another example of trying to balance your picture by having two subjects. If you decide to offset your subject in the picture frame, you should actually give them space to move. It creates a more natural picture rather than hemming them in. Another concept when you're deciding on taking your picture is that of leading lines. And it's good to look for these lines when you're composing your picture as they'll naturally draw your eye into an image and can work great in a combination with the subject that you wish to highlight. These are two examples of pictures with leading lines, but also note the subjects in the foreground. Can you see the leading lines in this picture? Once you've taken your picture, you can also consider using different filters. For instance, change your picture to black and white. Black and white doesn't necessarily work with all images, but it's good to try. Can you spot the leading line in this image? and also the position of the windmill. When taking your pictures, look for symmetry and patterns to create engaging images for your viewer by drawing their attention to specific details. When taking a picture, 
change your vantage point that's where you take your picture from and the angle that you take it from then you can decide on what perspective or what angle you like best the viewpoint you decide to take your picture from has this profound impact on the end image think of what you're trying to show try getting down low or get close to your subject and consider the background ideally it provides a point of interest but not a distraction that can lead to a confusing image perspective and an overview can create a dramatic effect but it should not be overused always consider the background of your picture as you don't want to lose focus on your main subjects always check your background so that there's no significant distractions this picture of garden flowers was i took with a flatbed scanner cameras often tend to flatten the foreground and background so beware of any distractions in the background also if you're taking a picture of a flower or a subject in your own garden there's an actual term called gardening when you remove the odd piece of grass or dead petal out of your image think of it a bit like flower arranging and getting your picture to have a well-groomed look when taking a picture having a subject in the foreground can add to your photo by providing scale and context I've included these pictures to demonstrate how foreground interests work. The picture on the left is a bench, which also would be a great place to have your subject or somebody, someone you know sitting there. Something else that I should mention is clouds. They also filled the blank space of the sky, and luckily we have a lot of clouds in Ireland. But when you're taking a picture, do think about these as being part of your composition. This picture on the right, the, floor, the flowers in the foreground add interest to the subject of the picture, which is Dorky Island. Look to have depth in your picture by focusing on a foreground subject, that's the subject that's closest to you, and having more distant objects in a more blurred state. You can practice this. When looking to take a picture of something, see if there is an object that actually provides a frame to your picture. This can be a tunnel, window, door or a tree, among many other things. Fill your frame with your subject. Zoom in. These are examples of what we call close-up or macro photography. So zoom into your subject and this will often provide a more blurred background. Here's another example of macro photography that you can easily practice. If you're, close, if you're lucky enough to be close to a beach, you can collect a couple of shells and place them on a black background, black piece of paper and take your picture. Another thing to look for is insects. The thing that probably makes this picture dramatic are the combination of the three colors, yellow, red, and green. Pets and animals can provide, well, I should say, sometimes they can provide as great models. How often? They often will not pose or have a good eye contact. The trick is to have something with you that interests them and to use this to lure their eyes to where you want. A similar approach can be taken with young children and toddlers. Also, as an aside, when you're composing your picture, look for natural triangles. These are pleasing to the eye. Experiment with your pictures when taking compositions. For example, place a flower or an object on a different color background and experiment with natural light and other forms of light. Rather than taking a picture of your garden flowers from above or to the side, try pointing your camera upwards and turn on your flash to fire. This can help you to have appropriately exposed pictures against a bright background. 
You can also set your exposure on your camera for the background to make a pleasing silhouette. For colour, look to include vibrant colour mixes and you can bring these together yourself and arrange them to create the image that you're looking for. Always try different experiments. The tulips in the picture on the left are in a vase with a picture in the background. If you want to tell a story, create a collage. Uh, and there are many programs and apps that will allow you or help you to do this. Water on flowers gives life to your picture. So if it's not raining or you are too late for the morning dew, consider bringing a water spray bottle with you. Another thing to do is to create dynamic or action in the water. Here I sprinkled a bunch of mussels uh, into the water. Have some fun and get your friends to pose, but think about how you would like to arrange them in the picture before you ask, and also consider the background. There are many different apps, and here's just a few of them that you can use to process your pictures. I hope this video gave you some ideas. Enjoy your hobby. Thanks for listening.